Many thanks, and uh, I don't disagree with you. I think the IA is absolutely the right place to be doing cell therapies. So uh, thanks for that little plug. And what I want to talk to you today is a project very dear to my heart. I spent the last 15 years developing the project. Um, and the idea was to take a cell therapy into the clinic. And um, within a five year period was our intention. Uh, that five year period starting in uh, 2009. Uh, unfortunately, it took us eight years, but this is that journey. So, um, one of the reasons the eye is so good for these types of um, uh, programs is um, it's one of the few regions in the body where you don't need very much in terms of technology to really look into the biology. And that's mainly because you've got a very nice window on the front um, which allows you to see into the back of the eye, which is the area of interest for me. And in fact, that uh, red flash, the red eye that you get, um, is actually an indication of the back of the eye. And the area which is most important for us today in terms of viewing um, this uh, presentation is an area which is literally 10 millimeters and is known as a, a region, not anything other than that, as the macula. Uh, the macula is the region where the outside world is focused, and in an area even smaller known as the fovea, which is about a millimeter in diameter. So you viewing this presentation is all processed in a 10 millimeter and a precise visual area known as the fovea. So why am I interested in this? I'm interested in this because one specific disease, um, which is age-related, and the title gives it away, a disease which occurs typically over the age of 65, 70, which is called age-related macula, which just defines the region of where the disease uh, happens, which is in uh, the... Uh, um, macular region, but it's in this macular region in which there's an onset of um, blindness occurring, not because the top half, so the macula contains three areas, it's a bit like, or three layers, a bit like an onion with its layers. It has a top layer, which is the neural retina, it has a um, uh, middle layer, which is um, the um, support layer known as the retinal pigment epithelium, which is uh, literally a monolayer of cells. And then at the back, it has a blood supply. That middle layer is where the onset of the disease for age-related macular degeneration occurs. So the pathology, the onset is in that middle layer, but for the health of the neural retina, you need that middle layer. Not having it means you start to see the degeneration in the neural retina, so the light sensitive cells start to die. So, my job over the last uh, 30 odd years has been trying to actually keep that area, the macular region, healthy uh, in people as long as possible. What happens with um, the onset of the disease? We had an artist in residence who took pictures of patients with age-related macular degeneration. This is a uh, Dennis who was involved in that. He took pictures and then painted those uh, pictures of those individuals in the way they saw it. And he didn't do it in black and white because that was trendy. He did it in black and white because part of the problem is you start to lose your color vision as the macula um, starts to degenerate, those light sensitive cells, a particular type, uh, the cone starts to degenerate. And this just shows you uh, another patient in which um, the encroachment of the disease is not completely on the macula, and it shows you the extent of the uh, visual uh, onset of this disease. So there are two types of age-related macular degeneration. There is the wet form, 
which accounts for about 10% of that clinical population. And there is the dry form here on the right, which um, it accounts for 90% of the clinical population. And he's specifically focused on that middle layer on the RPE. The wet form, and the reason it's called wet, is because what happens is you get a breakdown in that middle layer and little vessels start to uh, push through from that blood supply at the back of the choroid and they're very leaky. So you get bleeds uh, which occur uh, as a consequence of these new vessel formations. Um, the onset of this and the rapidity uh, can be literally within 12 weeks if these bleeds aren't stopped. Uh, a patient can go blind. In the dry form, it's much more slower. It can be months and years. So our target population in what we were trying to do was to restore the architecture, that middle layer, the RPE, the support cells um, in this group of patients, and specifically in patients in which the bleeds couldn't be stopped by using um, drug therapies, which are uh, successful in about nine out of 10 patients, but in one out of 10 patients, these bleeds will continue. And that was our target group. And again, this just gives you an illustration of what that visual loss is like. Why did we think this may work? We thought it may work because we'd done two clinical um, procedures prior to looking at um, an artificial construct. One of them was where we would lift that top layer, the neural retina, and move it away, which is here. Here's the disease and here's the macula. So you lift the whole of the top layer and rotate it about 30 degrees. So you move the macula away from the underlying disease, the RPE. Um, about 40 patients went through uh, both this procedure and the second one was where we actually lasered out uh, some RPE uh, from the periphery and then moved it into uh, and under and on top of the diseased RPE. In both these procedures, and in fact, the macular translocation is a nice approved procedure now, patients did get their vision back to a level which in uh, a small group of patients um, actually resulted in them in getting their driving licenses back. So what we wanted was not to actually use the patient or do that massive um, uh, translocation. They were long operations. They would be three hours plus, and they would include uh, further operations uh, due to the rotation. So what we wanted was to produce a layer, a single layer of RPE, and the two components there are this crazy pavementing, this pebble stone uh, appearance and also the black pigmentation. But we didn't want to just inject it into uh, the back of the eye. We wanted to form that carpet. So we put it on an artificial membrane. So what we had was a three by, mille, three by six millimeter patch of RPE in a single monolayer. The reason for the size of that was it would give you a big enough visual field to be able to um, read. We also had to produce um, a surgical tool in order to deliver this. And this top row of uh, cartoons illustrates what we had to do. So you have to make a small incision in the side. Uh, you see these three layers, the top layer, the RPE and the blood. You can separate the top layer from the middle layer. There's a natural um, uh, break uh, between those two layers, which you can um, separate by injecting fluid. You make an incision in the top retina, and then you post the patch under the macula. And this operation um, takes about 40 to 45 minutes uh, in a patient and um, can be done uh, under um, a uh, local anesthesia, and therefore um, is a procedure which can be basically an outpatient procedure. So 
In 2015, um, we were at a point where we'd used cells, embryonic stem cells. We'd managed to differentiate them into RPE. We'd put them on an artificial membrane and we'd been able to um, take them through the whole um, process of manufacturing them to a clinical um, uh, uh, style, taking them through a number of um, uh, procedures, tested them for tumor genicity, et cetera. So in August 2015, what we were faced with was patients in which we had this new vascular complex, which was leaky and bleeding, and unfortunately could not be uh, suppressed. Um, and therefore, what we would do is take any scar tissue out and also clean the blood and then place our patch into the region in which um, the RPE and the vascular uh, complex was removed. So we have a, a manufacturing um, cells for site, GMP facility at the Institute of Ophthalmology. Um, we are behind uh, Moorfields Eye Hospital. And on the day we placed it into this little holder, walked it round and into the surgery in Moorfields Eye Hospital. Um, under um, regulatory approval, um, we are allowed uh, eight hours to get it from the Institute of Ophthalmology to the surgery in um, uh, Moorfields Eye Hospital. And um, even in my fit state, I can do that in 10 minutes. Um, uh, it was taken through to surgery uh, by uh, Julie. We had a collaboration. Uh, Julie Kirby, who was working with Pfizer at the time, she's now a uh, cell therapy catapult, and Kate, who was um, from UCL, who's now at GSK, uh, Amid and Yvonne, who were clinical fellows. Uh, who were doing PhDs, and Catherine, who's the surgical sister, who just looks like she's going for a punch up. And they're smiling because they're handing it over to Amid and then immediately went back to the lab and got absolutely uh, crashed on champagne. So, this was the first uh, picture of that first patient. And this is the huge bleed, which was nearly a full third of the back of the eye. Uh, it encroaches right over the macula. So uh, what we needed to do is remove the blood first and then post that patch. This is after that surgery. You can see the extent of the bleed, which went all the way up and down uh, into the retina. And this is the patch here uh, in this first patient. Um, so effectively, what we had was our first patient which had a 60 year old, she was 60 years old, 60 year old retina, now sitting on top of our new manufactured RPE, which was basically zero. And just fortuitously, there was still some of her own RPE, which was uh, very lateral to, to where the patch was. So it wasn't on our purpose surgically, but we also had an internal control uh, as to how functional the RPE, uh, her RPE was compared to the new RPE, which we just transplanted. So uh, for um, time, I'm going to just uh, talk about um, visual outcome, not the various uh, psychophysical and physiological tests that we use uh, to determine visual income, but I'm just going to the standard. If you go to an, opto uh, an optometrist, uh, you'll see the chart on the right, which has the big E on the top. In clinical trials, um, it's the EDTRS that's used, which um, was developed uh, for testing diabetic vision. Um, and the difference is you have five letters on any one line. And um, it's a statistical issue for confidence rather than just using one. So the top line, um, which is uh, uh, 2200 or 660 in the UK, um, you would be registered blind. Uh, these patients were coming in and um, not being able to really see that top line. We were hoping to get a three line improvement. That is still um, limiting in terms of vision. Uh, 
2020 vision, R66, is some way down, but it would at least uh, give some ability back uh, to those patients. So the first patient that I showed you in terms of that histology um, literally could just read um, nearly two lines on the eye chart. We, in our primary endpoint, were expecting, if this was successful, to improve that vision by three lines. Um, that first patient gained uh, six lines of vision, which was quite surprising. But this is single letters. What we were trying to do, and the reason for that patch and the size of the patch was the patient would be able to um, scan and view the world, and if successful, would be able to read. So in this first patient, um, pre-transplantation, they could read just about one and a half words a minute. And this shows you how uh, torturous that was for uh, that individual. Post-transplantation, and uh, you'll see in a minute, um, I recently gave this talk in America, post-transplantation, she's now reading nearly 80 words a minute. So this was a huge improvement. The second patient couldn't even read one line of letters. Again, we were hoping to get a three line improvement. And this individual has improved by five lines. Again, in terms of reading speed, this patient could not read anything. Um, Post-transplantation, after putting the patch in, this patient is now able to read nearly 40, 50 words a minute. So how have these patients uh, gone since uh, 2015? And this is the two year uh, data. We have uh, four and five years now. So the green line indicates what we would say and the primary endpoint was where we would want them to be if at six months post, post transplantation. So both these patients over the last two years have improved their vision. But more importantly, on the right here is the sustained reading speed, which we didn't expect to see at the speed in which they were doing. So the first patient is still reading nearly uh, 70 uh, words a minute, and the second patient is still reading between 40 and 50 words a minute. Um, I'm just going to show you the second patient. I don't know whether the um, uh, audio is going to come through, so hopefully it will. I will do another left eye. Before his pioneering stem cell treatment, Douglas Waters was completely blind in his right eye. Now he can see. Everyone wanted to go outside when the rain finally stopped. That's perfect. So this is an amazing improvement, Mr. Waters. I just couldn't believe it. And each morning I pick things out in the bedroom to look at, out in the garden and I do this. And it's unbelievable. I really chuffed the page of the face. And um, in fact, he couldn't actually see the book when he actually came in uh, to the clinic. As ever, and not surprisingly, there's a huge group of individuals that were involved in this process. Uh, is Julie down here. Uh, we even, during the whole sort of 15 years, had a young member appear. Um, but um, we now have data stretching through to four and five years. So uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I think for myself, it's been a great journey and uh, we're still continuing that. So thanks very much. Thank you, Pete, thank you. So we have one question about the patch. Can you tell us a little bit more what you're patching into? Yes, so the patch is, um, it's a stem cell derived RPE. Uh, human embryonic. 
um, in which we take um, an embryonic stem cell line, differentiate it into RPE, and then seed it onto a polyester patch. It's very simple, um, uh, which is fenestrated. It's got holes in it. Um, and then it's cut to that three by six millimeter size. And sorry, and the protocol, I remember in the times of Pfizer and Nuzentis, when the protocol was being established, there was an element of witchcraft in uh, finding the black spots. And so is there a standardized protocol now for the RPE? Um, it's the same. It's a spontaneous differentiation for the clinical trial. But um, we've uh, changed various things in which we can automate the selection of the RPE. Um, and, go ahead. Okay. No, please, please. Oh, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. I'll have a quick fit. And uh, in terms of delivery, do you, I mean, I know there are methods that use image analysis, for example, in order to sort of find the exact spot where you deliver the cells. How, how and I understand that the, the layers can be uh, separated. How, how absolutely essential it is to put the cells in the right place? Uh, it's definitely essential because what, what you need to do is ensure that the RPE are replacing the dystrophic RPE. So, um, but you can see that very easily. And um, it's the beauty of imaging in the eye. It's very simple to see where the RPE and those vascular um, complexes are. So um, it's, it's easy to see where the spot is. In terms of the surgery, um, the surgery is um, uh, surgery which involves all the procedures you would do for a um, detached retina. So um, the, the uh, expertise is there in vitro retinal surgeons, but obviously there is some components because it's actually replacing things rather than just sticking down and retina. Thank you. So we have two questions. If we can try, uh, I'll try to read them as fast as I can. So the first is from Sandra Petrus Rohrer. Interesting talk, Pete, was wondering about the immunosuppression regime using these patients and if that can be problematic on a population that is already aged, and how is the perspective to tackle immune response in the future to avoid graft rejection? So um, it's a great question. Um, we asked uh, a number of immunologists um, what did they themselves think would be appropriate in terms of immunosuppression. And um, um, I'm going to say it here and probably get beaten up. You never get a straight answer out of an immunologist. And, um, you know, half of them will say, go hell for leather and um, kill the whole immune system. Uh, the other half will say, well, it depends whether you do it before, after, during or whenever. So in the end, what we did is something, again, which is uh, straightforward in um, ophthalmology in terms of vitreal retinal surgery, um, is depotting um, steroids into the back of the eye. So you can do that with uh, an injection into the sclera of um, a steroid, pronicillin, or trimicinolone, which lasts about three months, which is what we did. And also, uh, there's a condition known as uveitis, in which you get inflammation into the back of the eye. And again, a steroid capsule is used to dampen down the immune response. So we place the, a steroid capsule into the patient. Those capsules last for uh, two to three years. So um, it was all local immunosuppression. There was no major in immunosuppression in any of the patients whatsoever. 